Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is retired U.S. Navy Commander Dean Diz Laird, a veteran of three different wars. He is an ace aviator and is the only one known to have recorded kills in both the European and Pacific theaters of World War II. And Commander, thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. Let's start at the very beginning for you. Where were you born and raised? I was born in a little town of Loomis, California, which is about 30 miles east of Sacramento. And uh, uh, in 1921, I was born. From a long line of Lairds and Smythes, my family had been settled there for since before the gold rush. Wow. And uh, participated in the gold rush. And uh, my grandparents both were born there. And uh, my dad was born there. And we had a, had a lot of lairds that lived in that area for a while, but now there's none. Now, the nickname Diz, did you get that as a kid or after you joined the service? And is it because of the pitcher, Dizzy Dean? It is because of the pitcher, Dizzy Dean. And, and it, Dean was what my mother named me. And I played baseball when I was in high school. And of course, as soon as the kids knew my name was Dean, I became Dizzy. <laughs> and they called me Dizzy uh, a lot, and <clears throat> I got in the Navy when I came to my first first fighter squadron. I, my, my CO, I went in for uh, an interview with him, and he said, "Do you have a nickname?" And I told him, uh, "Not really. I said uh, I used to be called Diz, Dizzy, or Dizzy." Uh, um, in high school, and he said, that's good enough for me, because you're dizzy from now on. So. <laughs> Aviators, you got to have the handle, right? Yeah. So you joined just after Pearl Harbor was attacked, correct? Yes. What was your reaction to the attack? Well, uh, I was, I was kind of shocked. I never expected it. Of course, I guess a lot of other people didn't expect it either. <coughs> and uh, um, I found out about it. I got up in the morning, that, that Sunday morning, and drove out to the Auburn Airport. I was going to rent an airplane and go fly on. I had a pilot's license at that time. And um, <coughs> they thought I was crazy. Do you know what's going on? Uh, what's going on? I know all I want to do is rent an airplane. And, well, we're at war. Pearl Harbor's been attacked. And, uh, uh, everything was news to me. And that's when I found out about the war. Would you have joined the service anyway, or did that make your decision for you? No, I was planning on joining the Army Air Corps. Um, I had papers out for it. <coughs> My brother and I were both talking about it. And uh, uh, I, uh, it was about the same time that I saw a newsreel in which they had a, showed a battleship with a, with a, 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 a makeshift flight deck on it and an airplane taking off. And then they showed a picture of our, our first carrier, the, the Langley, and an airplane landing aboard it. And I thought, damn, that's got to be more fun than anything. I think I'll just go join the Navy. So I did. Nice. Very nice. So where did they send you first to train? <coughs> I started out at Oakland, <coughs> Oakland, California. At the the Navy had an, it was called the Navy, Naval Reserve Air Base on the air, airfield at, at uh, airport at, at Oakland. And that's, that's where I reported and stayed for about 
two, two months. Okay. What planes were you flying at first? Well, um, we were flying the N3Ns there. N3N was in, uh, built by the Navy. The Navy had an aircraft factory in Philadelphia. And <coughs> it was built, it was pretty much a copy of the, of the Stearman, which it was, I forget who built that. I knew. Um, and then both the Navy and the and the Army Air Corps used the Stearman as a trainer, and but the Navy ended up u using more N three Ns, which they built themselves in their factory in Philadelphia. Did you like flying the N three Ns? Oh yeah, it was a, it was it was fun to fly. Yeah. And then, how soon did you get deployed? Oh well, it took. It took me almost a year to get get to my first squadron. I stayed in Oakland for about, uh, as I say, January end of February. <coughs> then they sent me to Dallas uh, Naval Air Station. <coughs> I was in a pool there with a whole bunch of other guys from different uh, bases. They call them elimination bases, like Oakland, Seattle, Long Beach, uh, St. Louis, Kansas City, all, all over the country they had these elimination bases. And then when people would finish there, they'd send them to a pool, and usually at Dallas. And, uh, and then from there they would send them to the two main training stations, which was Corpus Christi and Pensacola. I, after a month in Dallas, I was sent to Pensacola, um, where I did most of my training. And so that Pensacola was the last stop? Well, no. Uh, I did primary training there and basic training there and uh, instrument training. Uh, got an instrument card. <laughs> and then they sent me to advanced training, which was done in, in, in Miami, uh, Opelaka Naval Air Station down there. <laughs> and there we did advanced training in, in uh, SNJ's, uh, uh, SNJ Texan, and uh, and we finished that, we went into uh, a service type airplane, which was the Brewster Buffalo, the F-2A. <coughs> and that was the first real airplane that I flew. It had a, one of those great big round engines, you know, and made a lot of noise and had about 1,200 horsepower. And it, uh, a little more pop. It was, a lot of airplane. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Tough adjustment or no? No. No, I, I found that <coughs> even <coughs> no matter what airplane it is, they all have a throttle over here <laughs> and a stick. And if you want to go fast, you pull on the throttle. You want to go up, you pull on the stick. If you want to go down, you push on the stick. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, an N3N or a, uh, uh, an F4 Phantom or, or what. They all fly the same. Hmm. Maybe okay. a few little, little things different, but yeah, I figure you can fly one and it wouldn't take you very long to learn how to fly the other. So you're sent to the European theater first, correct? Well, yes. I finished Miami in, uh, I think it was about the 5th of August, October, rather, of 42. Went to Norfolk. I had to go through carrier qualifications, um, which we did in the, in the SNJ Texan. 
<coughs> Excuse me. And, and then I reported to my squadron, uh, which was uh, Fighter Squadron 441, and uh, uh, we were attached to the carrier Ranger, which was CV, CV4, fourth carrier we had. The first carrier we had that was built from the keel up as a, uh, as a carrier. And uh, it was it was not the greatest carrier in the world. I'll say that it was better than some, but where were you? Where was the we ship? Over, I was in Norfolk. Oh, okay. Uh, we we trained out of Norfolk for uh, let's see, December, January, February. March, but uh, we did a couple of short little deployments, uh, local deployments on the, on the Ranger, <coughs> just to build up a little carrier experience. And then in early April, we departed Norfolk. And uh, we eventually ended up a month or so later in Argentia, Newfoundland, where we <coughs> stayed for another, I don't know, forget, three, four months, five months maybe. Um, I'd have to go back and uh, check my logbook to make sure. <coughs> and we, we left there, we went back to Quonset Point, Rhode Island, and uh, I don't know why, but we did, and said goodbye to our wives, and and uh, we took off again, and we didn't know where we were going until we were, we were halfway there. <coughs> that uh, we were told we we were going to we were going to Great Britain, <coughs> so we we ended up. Uh, in Scapa Flow. Scapa Flow was the anchorage for the British home fleet. And we operated with, and, and actually uh, we were controlled by the commander of the British home fleet for several months while we were over there. We had been there for a couple of months and some bright fellow on our staff got the idea that we should be night carrier qualified. Um, we complained about it and explained that we, we loved carrier operations during the day, but we preferred the company of women during the night. And that we were not too thrilled about going out and flying off the carrier at night. We lost our argument. They decided to brief us. They would call us all down to the, the officer's ward room. <coughs> the briefing officer was the executive officer of the ship, who was the only one aboard the ship who had ever made a night carrier landing. It turns out that he made one and it was uh, not the best landing in the world. And uh, that was a, about eight or nine years earlier. <laughs> and uh, when we finished uh, his briefing, they said, okay, you guys, man your airplanes and instead of sending off you know, like they do now maybe four or five or six airplanes and just keep them in this pattern and, and let them make landings <coughs> and launch the whole air group all 72 of us and we 
I was near the last of the of the fighters. The fighters were first to go to get a go start landing. Um, the first night I didn't get into the landing pattern even. I, we were ran low on fuel after <coughs> circling for two or three hours, and we had to go into Argentia to land. In fact, there were almost every airplane that we launched ended up in Argentia. Hmm. And we flew back the next day, and they <coughs> proceeded to tell us what lousy aviators we were, and and told us to man our airplanes again, and we went through the same same routine again that night, and for several more nights after that. And uh, uh, we got to know Argentia at night pretty well, but uh, <laughs> that's where we spent it. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Um, <coughs> um, I think they finally gave up on qualifying everybody, and I'm not sure if anybody. It might have been one or two pilots in, in each squadron that got qualified, but qualified. the rest of us had maybe two landings or three landings, or some people maybe not even any. But hmm. well, was, let's go back to Great Britain because that's where we left off at the end yeah. of the last segment. Well, How long were yeah. you there before you got engaged in the skies over Europe? Well, uh, let's see, we got over there in June, let's say June. June of 43? Yes. Okay. And uh, <coughs> we, we'd go out, <coughs> did a lot of operating up along the Norwegian coast, and which wasn't the greatest. It was in October when we first got our, our first our first uh, combat action. What was that like after all this training, after all this anticipation, when you actually engaged with the enemy? Well, uh, as it was, <coughs> um, I wasn't scheduled to fly that that day. And uh, they had a combat air patrol out, and they were looking for a, a target which our radar showed was on the showed on the screen, <coughs> and they this flight couldn't find it. The weather was kind of crummy, and uh, they were bringing them back aboard and going, "We're going to send a relief flight out." Well. Um, I should tell you that I, I used to get seasick. Hmm. I'd ship, it wasn't a, you know, this type of thing, it wouldn't bother me, but it was just a gentle thing like you might get in a rowboat out on the bay, and uh, I don't know if you've done that or not, but mm -hmm. I was always subject to motion sickness, even in the car as a little kid. <coughs> so. Uh, I used to volunteer for every flight I could get, and <coughs> I, I found out finally that there were two or three pilots that seemed to have more engine trouble before takeoff than, than the rest of us. And I found that if we always had a a spare pilot up there. If we had a flight of four, say, we had five airplanes ready to go, and we'd put a spare pilot in there, and if one of these went down, this guy would go. So <coughs> I got the smart idea, well, it's a good way to get flight time, and, and almost always a uh, spare pilot gets him up. And so I used to volunteer to be the spare pilot whenever whenever I could. Oh, I did this day. <coughs> and sure enough, I got airborne. <coughs> when we went out, we relieved that other group that had been out there looking <coughs> for a couple, couple of hours. And as I say, the weather was rather crummy. And 
they vectored us around looking for this, this bogey out there, and um, we couldn't find it either. Finally, they were started. They said, "Now oh, come on back to the ship," and they started back, and, and he and they said, "Gave us a signal, Buster. Buster meant everything forward. Get back as fast as you can." <clears throat> My airplane. Uh, Buster was about 10 or 15 knots slower than anybody else's Buster, <laughs> and I couldn't keep up with him. And but when they told us to come on back, I knew that there was a, a bogey out there somewhere because this this radar operator we had aboard the ship was was excellent, and if he. If, I never known him to be wrong. If he <coughs> thought a, a, he had a little problem, a, 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 a target out there, uh, there was a target there. It was an airplane. So while we were heading back towards the uh, the fleet again, I kept looking backward. I was falling behind anyway, full full throttle. Kept looking backward, back where we'd come from, and sure enough, they. Uh, uh, I, I saw this airplane come out from behind a big cloud, huge cloud, and there were clouds all over. But came out from behind this big cloud, went around the front of it, and went around, and went around the back on the back side, right on the right. <clears throat> so I called Tally Ho and told him what I saw, and my my section leader turned immediately, and I went with him because we were this way. So I was caught up with him on the turn, <clears throat> and I explained to him exactly what I saw, and uh, so we headed towards the side of this huge cloud, from which. This airplane had had appeared, and uh, sure enough, here he came again. And uh, it was a, a Junkers 88, one of Germany's best bombers. And he apparently saw us about the same time we saw him, because he turned immediately and headed south, which I think was the direction of Germany. <laughs> and we went chasing after him and finally caught him and um, my my leader went up on the right side to sit in position to make a high side run and I went up to the left side and <coughs> the leader came in and he fired and I came in and I, I fired and we had him smoking and we came up and Peter came back again, and, and I came in again. And this time, I, I tried to aim where I thought the uh, uh, most likely place that they would have a, a, a fuel tank. And I think I guessed right because <coughs> while I'm firing, this, explain, uh, this airplane, the Ju-88, just. Exploded in a big ball of fire, and a lot of extraneous airplane parts flying <laughs> in every direction, and uh, uh, that was the end of him. Anyway, we headed back towards the fleet, and they gave us another vector out in the opposite direction. <coughs> and this time, we'd gone oh well, maybe 25, 30 miles. And we came to a, a, a just a black wall of water, rain, and uh, we were spread out like this again. The leader was going full, full blower, and I was tail end Charlie. I couldn't keep up at all. And, and they, he got to this line squall, and he turned left and paralleled it. He and the second guy went 
with him, and the third guy did. And and about then, I saw in the inside that squall and a strange airplane going in the opposite direction. And uh, I called Tallyho, told him what I saw, went up there, and I turned and started following him. <coughs> I really hoped I was following him. I couldn't see anything. The visibility was terrible. But I was flying down fairly low, uh, probably ceiling high off the, wa off the water. I had to try to keep, keep the water visible so I wouldn't run into it. And, and there was, the visibility was really bad. So, I'm going along there for a, a few minutes, and uh, and all of a sudden, at about 11 o'clock position to me, here came an airplane, and I it was pretty close, and I got a chance to see what it was. It had. Uh, it was a twin engine, and it had twin floats uh, right underneath the engines. <coughs> um, a monoplane, one wing, whatever that means, and uh, I didn't, I didn't have too much time to uh, aim or. Get any real assessment on the on it? I had pulled up and put my gun sight up, trying to hit the the port or yeah his port engine. <coughs> I pulled up and I pulled the trigger and just a brrrr, and just a short burst is all I got and I went by him like that. <coughs> I had to duck because I thought I, I was I thought my my tail sticking up was going to hit him. I was that, that close. Wow. I, I missed him, <coughs> except I blasted the hell out of his, his pontoon that was underneath that, that port engine. <coughs> and I, then I turned around to follow him, and I have figured out that he he was doing somewhere around 300 knots and so was I and then I got behind him and I could not catch him I mean, it was just uh, this airplane that airplane was was a fast fast moving bird and uh, the Wildcat wasn't known for its great speed, but it would do 300 or better knots, that is. <coughs> well, anyway, I'm, gonna, I'm behind him, <coughs> but I'm, I know I'm out of range. Uh, our, our, our machine guns were good, were 50 calibers, were good for about, about a thousand feet. Anything over that, you were, it was just luck if you hit anything. Or you hit what you were aiming at, <coughs> and I gave a couple of bursts, and I couldn't tell where they went. We were both going about the same speed, and and I figured I was out of range anyway, and the, the tracers would burn out before they ever got got up there. So I, <coughs> I was sure I wasn't hitting him, but I. <coughs> I kept following him, trying to catch him, and I dropped down and pick up some speed this way, and and go and try to pick up a few hundred yards on him, and I, I just it was almost impossible. I pulled back up, and of course I'd lose speed when I pulled up, and I'd lose that distance too. <coughs> so finally. I said to myself, why don't you, you know that the bullets drop, and 
a thousand feet, they drop about three feet. And why don't you go up and aim maybe 10 or 15 or even 20 feet above him and see if you can lob some up there and hit him. And I didn't know how high to shoot or anything. This was a real, real guesswork. And uh, I, I, we're still both going same airspeed. And, and I find a, I, I pulled up, aimed over the top of him. And I squeeze off a long burst. And I don't know if it hit him or not. I couldn't tell. The tracers burned out before they got there. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't tell whether the bullets dropped behind him or went over the top of him or hit him or anything. <coughs> and then uh, all of a sudden, he he, he seemed to slow down, dropped his flaps, and was heading down to land, or, not, or well, make a water landing. He was on his on his floats, and I thought, well, maybe I did hit him. <coughs> well, he he touched down, and when he did that that port float just collapsed. It, it would, there wasn't much left of it to begin with when I hit it that first first time. And he, uh, it collapsed, the left wing dropped, hit the water, and he just cartwheeled. And came to a stop. The time I got up there, the three crewmen had gotten out. They were all together beside the fuselage and and uh, they waved to me and I gave them a salute and we circled and our leader came along and he he called back the home base to see if they'd send a destroyer over to pick these guys up and they said no they didn't want them well it wouldn't have done any good that water was so cold that they Probably were dead within 15 minutes. Anyway, 20 at the most. <coughs> the reason I say that is just a week or so below. Before that, we had a, a pilot come in, making a landing, and he he got in very close, and he started drifting from left to, uh, right to left, and he landed, and he went over the side. Well. He got out of the airplane right away. We had a destroyer, a, dis a British destroyer, was flying the plane guard position back here about 100 yards. He was right there within 20, 30 seconds at the most. Threw him a line, and he was all right so cold he couldn't hold on to it. So they put a boat in the water with four sailors and a coxswain. <coughs> the sailors, they got to him, they, they went in the water and they got him out and they got each other back aboard the boat, got back to the destroyer, and uh, they, they, it was so, they were so cold from the hypothermia, they, all five of them, four sailors and our pilot died from oh, wow. hypothermia. Wow. So, <laughs> so I, was pretty sure those those uh, Germans were not going to survive very long, not long enough to, for a destroyer to come from an hour or so away to get them. Sir, let me just, in our last couple of minutes here, uh, I want to get to a couple different parts of your story. Uh, real quickly, how did you end up getting transferred to the Pacific? Oh, well, we, we, we came home in, in, let's see, that was in October. October 3rd, as a matter of fact. We came home, I got back to Quonset Point on the 5th of December. We traded in our Wildcats 
and got Hellcats. We moved up to uh, Ayer, Massachusetts, where we trained for a couple of months in our new planes. And then we went to San Diego, got on a Jeep carrier, which carried us out to Hawaii, and, and we went to uh, we went down to Hilo, where we spent a couple of months in training again in, in our new airplanes. And <coughs> then we were uh, uh, transported again by, by a Jeep carrier out to Saipan, <coughs> where we met up with the carrier uh, um, um, thought I'd never forget it. Uh, <laughs> anyway, a new carrier, and uh, went aboard it, and we had just received all brand new airplanes, brand new F6-F5s, and, and while we were on that Jeep carrier going out to Saipan, each pilot had an airplane, and we 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 waxed them, the whole airplane, head to toe. We found that we could we could with a good wax job we could increase our our airspeed by ten to fifteen knots, hmm. and so we had we really really worked on those things. The skipper of that ship that picked us up. told us we, he already had a whole bunch of airplanes aboard and he didn't want those. So we had to leave them. <laughs> Somebody else got the benefit of our, our, all our work. <coughs> so we, uh, um, um, got aboard that carrier, went down to the Philippines, joined up with, uh, with Halsey we stayed on that ship for about a month, and then we moved over to the Essex, and uh, the other ship uh, went home, had to have a few little uh, things fixed before it came back in January. <coughs> so we spent the rest of our cruise on Essex. That was, let's see, that was, in the, we got aboard Essex about the first of, uh, of October, and uh, we stayed on there and, until April. They kicked us off, replaced us with another air group, and I, <coughs> I didn't want to go because I, I knew damn well that the next big operation had to be uh, Okinawa, and I wanted part of that. And uh, I, so I went up to my squadron commander's office, uh, cabin, and I told him, like, I just didn't do I, 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 I don't want to go. I wanna, I, I'd like to get a transfer to this new group that just replacing us right now and stay aboard Essex, and Jesus, he, he flipped his lid. Told me I was crazy, screamed at everybody in the ship could hear him, I think, and that I was suffering from combat fatigue, and I did uh, all this crap. He said, I won't approve anything like that. You're, you're, you're crazy, you're crazy. I thought I was going to have to scrape him off the overhead. And anyway, he said, you go down and get your gear and get down to the quarter deck. We're leaving this ship, and you're going with us. Well, I went with him. And we came back to San Diego. <coughs> and, um, that was the end of that cruise. Uh, from there on, I didn't do my well. 
I got orders to a new squadron up in Brunswick, Maine called Experimental Fighter Squadron 200. I don't know where the other 199 were, but there's, <laughs> we have 200 now. And, and our, our, our job, we worked with, the, with units of the Atlantic Fleet, destroyers, cruisers, people like that, to, and we 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 acted as as uh, kamikazes, and we'd make kamikaze runs on them and pull out at the last minute. And they were trying to develop tactics to beat the kamikaze, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> Just buzz the hell out of those guys. <laughs> and, Sure, they were scared more than we were, and, <coughs> and then, uh, then the end of the war came, and they didn't need that uh, training for kamikaze, so they they moved us down to Norfolk and changed us into a, a, a regular fleet squadron. We stayed there for another six or eight months and moved to Atlantic City and <coughs> was there for a little over a year and, and uh, that's when I got orders to the Navy's first jet squadron. Real quickly, what does it mean to you to be an ace pilot? I, 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 I guess except for the fact that not everybody becomes an ace, it, it doesn't really mean much at all. You're, it's, uh, um, it proves one thing that, that, that you had to be a pretty good pilot and uh, a good gunner. And, and really, that's about all it does prove. Well, sir, we thank you for your time here. We thank you most of all for your service to our nation. And uh, as folks will know if they, they read more on you, it wasn't just World War II. It was Korea, Vietnam, all the way to the early 1970s. So thank you very much for your time and your service. All right. Diz Laird, retired U.S. Navy commander, veteran of three wars, ace aviator, and the only man to record kills in both the European and Pacific theaters of World War II. This is Veterans Chronicles.